So, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you're listening in. I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to today's lesson. Today we are going to be talking about neonatal jaundice, also known as neonatal hyperbilirubinemia. This lesson is primarily designed for basic clinical medicine students, but it can still serve uh, purposes of um, revision. So feel free to share it around, let your friends know about it. My name is Violet Aswa. I am a lecturer of pediatrics at the Kenya Medical Training College in the Department of Clinical Medicine. So once again, welcome. So in this lesson, our scope will be limited to a, a couple of things. We shall look at the introduction, just to say generally uh, the things that you need to consider when dealing with uh, neonatal jaundice. We shall look at the etiologic factors. Then we shall look at generally how babies or neonates presenting with jaundice are likely to present. And then, uh, of course, go through the differential diagnosis. And then we shall take time to look at specific entities so that you get to understand from the differential diagnosis then how do you consider that this is physiologic jaundice, how do you determine that this is pathologic jaundice, and then we shall say something small about uh, feeding, how feeding is related to jaundice, and breast milk, and the worst case scenario which is usually connectorous. Finally, we shall talk about how do you assess or examine a baby or a neonate who presents with jaundice and finally look at the treatment for hyperbilirubinemia itself. We shall not go into the other specific uh, treatments, for example, uh, addressing the cause because the causes are many and they will be covered uh, when we are covering those particular conditions in the neonate. So for this uh, lecture, we'll only be addressing phototherapy and exchange transfusion. We will begin with a few introductory statements. And here we are saying that jaundice is a fairly common occurrence in the neonatal population. And most of the times it is benign in nature, which means most of the time it is not dangerous most of the time it is not serious. However, depending on the type of bilirubin that is causing the jaundice, whether direct or indirect, which means whether or not it is conjugated, then it can become potentially harmful. And in this case, we are referring to the unconjugated or indirect bilirubin. It is usually neurotoxic, especially when um, treatment is delayed or it is not done effectively. Also, some babies may present with a predominant um, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. This, while it is not neurotoxic in nature, it still um, indicates a potentially dangerous um, systemic disease. And most of the time, these kinds of conditions will be those affecting the biliary tree, which means there are conditions which interfere with the clearance or excretion of bilirubin from the circulation. And so when we say that a baby has jaundice, we are simply referring to what is observable clinically as a yellow discoloration of the skin and mucous membranes. And the reason the baby appears yellow is because of the accumulation uh, of the jaundice in those areas that we have mentioned. So the unconjugated form of bilirubin, like we said, is neurotoxic in infants, particularly those who are preterm, the premature ones, and uh, it occurs at a certain levels of bilirubin, which means the higher levels of bilirubin, the more likely that the baby will develop neurotoxicity. The conjugated bilirubin, however high it may be, it is not associated with neurotoxicity. Like, but like we said, it is usually an indication of a potentially serious condition, particularly one that would be causing obstruction. So it's important to note that a newborn 
infant's metabolism of bilirubin is usually in transition form. Excuse me. And so it is usually transiting from the fetal type of, uh, from the fetal stage rather, to the adult stage. It means that during the fetal stage, bilirubin is produced from the breakdown of the RBCs. And usually, even if it is conjugated, you know, the baby or the fetus is not able to excrete it by themselves. So remember, the fetus will usually depend on the mother via the placenta for nutrition, blood supply, oxygen, and so on and so forth. It also depends on the same for excretion of waste products. One of the waste products would be bilirubin. And for it to be excreted from the fetus via the maternal placenta, it has to be deconjugated again and become lipid soluble. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention this, that the conjugated bilirubin is usually water soluble and so easily excreted. But the unconjugated bilirubin is usually fat soluble or lipid soluble. So even in the fetus, for bilirubin to be excreted, it has to be deconjugated be reversed into the fat soluble state so that it can be able to be excreted via the placenta. In the adult stage, bilirubin is excreted as is after uh, it has been conjugated and it is usually uh, conjugated in the liver and then it is excreted via the biliary tree. So we are saying that when the baby is born, the metabolism of, of bilirubin is usually in transition from what has been in the fetal life, in the uterine, intrauterine life, to now what you and I experience. Okay, And now that has some implications. As we shall see, what happens when perhaps we say that uh, when a baby's feeding is delayed, that would predispose them to? Uh, having hyperbilirubinemia. So it will begin to make sense at that point. So before we go so far, let's look at uh, the etiology. We are looking at the causes. So um, a unit bilirubin levels may rise due to many reasons. Many things can potentially cause the bilirubin to rise. Number one, any cause that leads to an increased load of bilirubin that should be metabolized by the liver. So you have so much unconjugated bilirubin in the system that needs to be metabolized by the liver. At this point, I need you to remember that when the baby is born, even if they're born at term, most of their system is still not mature enough most of their systems and organs are not mature enough. And so they are not able to function optimally the way we see in older children or the way we may observe in adults. Therefore, a, a bilirubin load that would easily be metabolized and excreted by a six-month-old, for example, or a three-month-old baby, infant rather, may be too much for the liver to handle when this baby is still a neonate, okay? So anything that in causes an increased bilirubin load presented to the liver for metabolism is likely to cause jaundice. And the jaundice in this case is unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia because remember, it has not gone through the liver for it to be conjugated. So it is still fat soluble. So anything that may cause hemolysis, particularly hemolytic anemias, polycythemia means excessive production of red blood cells, which also means also that at the time of their breakdown, the amount of RBCs also being broken down will be high. And that, of course, will be commensurate to the level of bilirubin being produced. We have what we call the uh, HBF, that is the fetal hemoglobin. 
and which at that time is usually transiting. So HBF is what we see in the fetus. And now after birth, that has to be replaced by HBA, HB adult, which all of us now have. So the HBF has a shortened lifespan as compared to HBA. Now that can be a reason for an increased load of bilirubin uh, presented to the liver because then the, the HBF lifespan is shorter as compared to the HBA in other bigger children or adults. Another reason why you may have a shortened lifespan of RBCs is a scenario where a baby has been transfused and the cells are now being broken down much sooner than what we know as the 120 days. Then we have a situation where we call increased enterohepatic circulation. This one is very common, particularly when a baby is not fed. Um, the, the initiation of feeding does not happen soon after birth. The longer it takes for feeding to begin after birth, the higher the chances that there will be increased enterohepatic recirculation. And as we shall see, remember I told you that in the fetal life, in the intrauterine life, while bilirubin is conjugated, it cannot be excreted in that form. It's got to be deconjugated to become fat soluble again so that now it can be transported back to the maternal placenta so that it can be excreted. There is an enzyme in the GIT which is responsible for deconjugating the bilirubin so that it can be excreted by the placenta. This enzyme, when a baby delays in initiating feeding or they feed suboptimally, then that is likely to keep the conjugating bilirubin that has already been conjugated and is due for excretion. And so it keeps deconjugating and recirculating it. And that in itself would usually predispose to development of jaundice. And then we have infection. Infection will usually cause a shortened RBC lifespan and, uh, and sometimes increased hemolysis. And that would produce, uh, present a high load of unconjugated bilirubin to the liver. And the liver may not be able to handle the volume or the load. The second thing we're going to look at uh, in terms of etiology is damage or reduced activity of the transferase enzyme. Now, once bilirubin has been produced due to the breakdown of RBC and heme, the resulting bilirubin is unconjugated in nature and we have looked at some of the reasons why we may have an increased load of unconjugated bilirubin being presented to the liver for conjugation. Now, once the bilirubin has been produced, it's got to be transported to the liver and it does that by binding to certain proteins. So it's got to be bound to those proteins and then be transported to the liver and then there is the interface between the bloodstream the plasma and the hepatic cells so there's a membrane and then there's a, a transporting system which has to now transport um let me use a layman's way of explaining and say that uh, it's like <clears throat> the key to open up the door for the bilirubin to now enter the liver so that now it can meet with the transferase enzymes which are responsible for um, conjugation. Now, anything that interferes with the activity or reduces the ability of the transferase enzymes in the liver to conjugate will ultimately affect the degree to which uh, bilirubin is conjugated. And when that happens, then we'll have an increased load that is waiting, hanging around and waiting to be conjugated. So what are some of the conditions that can lead to this kind of scenario? We have genetic deficiencies, hypoxia, 
So you see why babies should not be allowed to be hypoxic. Infection, you can see infection is featuring a second time. Thyroid deficiency and hypothermia has also been associated with inability of the transferase enzymes to function. So babies should not be allowed to get cold. Excuse me, they should be kept warm. And at this point, I want you to go and read about cretinism. Cretinism is just congenital hypothyroidism. So that you can be able to relate with why babies who are born with congenital hypothyroidism will be prone to prolonged jaundice. The other etiologic factor to consider is competition or blockage of the transferase enzyme. And this can happen especially following drug administration to the mother. So it means that there are certain drugs and other substances which will usually uh, compete, okay? Compete for attachment. Remember, once the bilirubin has been uh, has gotten entry into the liver cells, the hepatocytes, it has to bind to the transferase enzymes. Now, if you have anything that is competing for that binding, then it will interfere with how well uh, the bilirubin is conjugated. Okay. The other thing is. Um, there are certain drugs also, and some of these drugs that we're talking about are those that need to be broken down by the same transferase enzymes in order for them to be excreted. So if a mother has taken those medications or some have been used in the baby, then um, this kind of scenario will be observed. All right. The fourth etiologic factor to consider is absence or decreased amounts of the enzyme or reduced bilirubin uptake by the liver cells. Remember I told you that at the interface between the plasma and the hepatocytes, there has to be a quote-unquote opening up and entry, you know. So anything that interferes with the ability of the hepatocytes to pick up the bilirubin in order for it to be presented to the transferase enzymes for conjugation will usually lead to accumulation of the unconjugated bilirubin and thus the baby will present with um, jaundice which is actually predominantly unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Some of the conditions that can lead to this scenario are genetic defects and prematurity. Feeding is also another etiologic factor and when we are talking about feeding we are looking at it in two forms. So for these purposes right now we are going to be talking about breast feeding jaundice. Later on I will talk we will talk about milk and jaundice you know so this is just one aspect of the relationship between breastfeeding and jaundice. So early and frequent feeding decreases serum bilirubin, whereas suboptimal sub feeding and dehydration will usually increase serum bilirubin. Okay, so we always encourage that mothers should begin to breastfeed within 30 minutes after the baby is born. The more initiation of feeding occurs, the higher the chance that the baby is likely to develop unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And I want to take you back to the, uh, the understanding of increased enterohepatic circulation and the function of deconjugating of the already conjugated bilirubin, which then again gain, gains access back into the circulation. So starvation, delayed feeding, Suboptimal feeding will usually lead to what we call breastfeeding jaundice. Breastfeeding jaundice occurs uh, maybe the second day of life, thereabout, 
and uh, the baby will develop jaundice because they did not feed optimally or they did not feed at all. There's a difference between this breastfeeding jaundice and what we call breast milk jaundice, which we shall talk about a little bit later. Drugs are another thing that we need to consider. Oxytocin, which is commonly used among, um, among uh, mothers who are laboring to augment labor, has been associated with the development of jaundice in the neonate. Besides oxytocin, there are other chemicals that have been found to, to lead to or to predispose to development of jaundice in the newborn. And some of these chemicals are commonly used in the newborn unit as detergents. Okay, so beware of that. So the seventh factor to consider is delay in passage of meconium. So to understand this point, it's important to know that uh, meconium usually contains one milligram of bilirubin per deciliter. So you can imagine with the effect of the deconjugation in the gut, with one milligram of bilirubin per deciliter of meconium, you can imagine how much bilirubin would be recirculating back into circulation. So this may contribute to jaundice by the enterohepatic circulation after the de deconjugation by the intestinal glucuronidase. This is the enzyme that usually deconjugates conjugated bilirubin and then it is recirculated back to cause jaundice. So those are the factors to consider in terms of etiology. So a few points to note here is that uh, bilirubin production is higher in the neonate as compared to the adults. And that is why you find that this is an important topic to discuss in the neonatal period. Neonates produce up to 8 milligrams of bilirubin per kg per day, which is double what adults produce, which is about a maximum of 4 milligrams per kg per day. The fat soluble bilirubin is usually bound to albumin, like I told you. Once it has been produced, it has to be transported to the liver. For it to be transported, it is bound to protein. Now, this is an important point for you to remember. That anything that would usually lead to hypoproteinemia, therefore, is also a predisposing factor to development of and conjugated hyperbilirubinemia and ultimately jaundice. So it has to be bound to albumin, be transported to the liver, then go through the membrane. So there's a carrier or transport system that transports or helps to move the bilirubin from the plasma into the hepatic cell. So let's see what happens. At the plasma hepatocyte interface, a liver membrane carrier transport transports bilirubin to a binding protein which prevents back absorption to plasma. So now it has been transported, it has gotten entry into the uh, liver and now it cannot be uh, transported back into plasma. These are just things for you to keep at the back of your mind and they will enhance understanding some aspects of this topic. So bilirubin is converted to bilirubin monoglucuronide, which is abbreviated as BMG or bilirubin diglucuronide, abbreviated as BDG. And these conversions are done by the functions or the actions of the, of the enzyme or enzymes of the group glucuronide transferase. So in the fetus, the conjugated monoglucuronide and diglucuronide must be deconjugated. I think I mentioned this earlier, that the conjugated bilirubin must be deconjugated by the tissue beta glucuronidases. These are a group of enzymes so that it can be able to, to be excreted via the placenta. So it has to be deconjugated 
back to the fat soluble state okay so that uh, that can facilitate its transportation and hence go to the placenta and its excretion so after birth intestinal or milk containing glucuronidases contribute to the enterohepatic recirculation of bilirubin and to the development of jaundice in the newborn i think now this is clear particularly for those who who asked what is the relationship between feeding and development of jaundice so you can see increased enterohepatic circulation is not um, an event that uh, predisposes to jaundice only among children who whose feeding is delayed but also even those who who delay in passing meconium and why is that the case it is the case because um, in the fetal life this uh, bilirubin must be deconjugated for it to be excreted so it takes some time before these uh, uh, glucuronidases are eliminated and therefore that effect reduces so when we began we mentioned the fact that while jaundice is most of the time a benign phenomena um, when it is not treated well promptly or effectively then it is potentially neurotoxic so there are certain factors that if or conditions that when they exist then they increase the likelihood of the bilirubin becoming toxic one of them uh, refers to a group of factors that will usually reduce the retention of bilirubin in circulation which means you see when we say that uh, bilirubin is neurotoxic it means it is becoming toxic to the nervous cells so how does it become toxic to the nervous cells particularly the nervous cells in the brain it will mean there is something that is causing the bilirubin to leave the circulation the plasma gain access to the brain tissue and cause its toxic effects so this is the meaning when we say factors which reduce the retention of bilirubin in circulation it means that when these things are present it is easy for bilirubin to leave plasma cross the blood brain barrier and gain access to the uh, nervous tissue in the cells and exert its toxic effects so what are some of those things hyponatremia from whatever cause certain drugs which will usually displace bilirubin from its binding sites on albumin so it also what that statement means is that the certain drugs when you consider your pharmacology which also require the albumin for them to be transported either to the site or to the liver for clearance for metabolism and excretion excuse me and excretion so if those drugs are present then they will interfere with bilirubin binding to albumin which is necessary for their transportation in through the plasma to the liver for conjugation acidosis acidosis will also increase the chances of the bilirubin leaving the plasma and gaining access into the uh, brain tissue hypoglycemia this leads to increased free fatty acid concentration okay so if the free fatty acids are increased it also means that the then that uh, because also remember that unconjugated bilirubin is also highly highly lipophilic it is fat soluble okay so if you have lots of fatty acids around then also you have lots of transportation mechanisms of the same of bilirubin and that can easily get access into the uh, neural tissue starvation so starvation goes together with hypoglycemia you know and then we have hypothermia so you see these are some of the things that we mention when we are taking care of the newborn and we say they should not be left to be to, to be cold they should uh, feed their feeding should not be delayed and things like that okay they should not be hypoxic if they're not initiating breathing well or they're not breathing adequately then they should be supplemented with oxygen because eventually hypoxemia 
potentially leads to acidosis. Right, then we have another group of uh, factors. These ones are twofold. They, one, increase the permeability of the blood-brain barrier or nerve cell membranes to bilirubin, or they increase the susceptibility of the brain cells to its toxicity. Initially, we were saying that uh, we have factors, factors which will usually increase or reduce the retention of bilirubin in circulation, which means they make it easy for bilirubin to escape plasma, cross the blood-brain barrier, and gain access to the neural tissue and cause uh, its uh, toxic effect. Then uh, we are moving away from that. And now we are saying there are those other factors which increase the permeability of the BBB, the blood-brain barrier, or the nerve cell membranes to bilirubin. So it means that they, 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 they make the, the blood-brain barrier more porous. And so it is easy for bilirubin to uh, pass through and gain access into the brain tissue. That is one aspect of this group. Or they just increase the susceptibility of the brain cells to the toxic effects of bilirubin. What are some of these factors that fit in this group? If a baby is asphyxiated, Okay, so they don't have enough oxygen in supply. If they are premature, if they are in any state of hyperosmolarity, and if they have infection, it could be sepsis, it could be the torches, any kind of infection will usually increase the susceptibility of the neural tissue to the toxic effects of bilirubin. Having said that, we are still just looking generally at jaundice. Uh, what increases the, uh, what causes or puts the neonate in a position where they have a high bilirubin concentration. We have looked at that. That's, that's very general. We have looked at uh, um, what is likely to cause uh, or enhance the toxic effects of bilirubin to the nervous tissue which is what actually makes this condition very important. Without neurotoxic effects, bilirubin has no other dangerous effect on the body of, of a neonid. So now we are still just talking generally. Now let's talk about clinical manifestations. Of course, the first and foremost thing that uh, uh, will indicate the presence of jaundice or uh, not really jaundice, the presence of hyperbilirubinemia will be the presence of jaundice when you examine, okay? So jaundice may be present at birth or at any time during the neonatal period, depending on the cause. Now, this statement is very important for you to remember because when you're looking at the differential diagnosis, the first thing that you will require to know is on which day of life did the jaundice show up? or did the jaundice begin, all right? So just the presence of jaundice is what makes every clinician know that there is hyperbilirubinemia. And we're saying it can occur at any time from the day of birth, zero minutes of life, jaundice can be present and it can occur at any time after that. So it usually begins on the face and as the serum levels of bilirubin increase, it progresses. So it has what we call the cordial uh, <laughs> head to toe progression. Okay. So uh, the, the mildest jaundice, if you remember your clinical methods, the mildest jaundice can be picked from the sclera, which means that if you check the sclera and there is no jaundice, there's no tinge of jaundice, then it would be ridiculous to look for jaundice elsewhere because then it will not be there, all right? So it usually progresses from head to toe. So the dermal pressure may reveal the anatomic progression of jaundice. So like we are saying, since it has a tendency to, to, to present first from the head going down, it means that the mildest form will begin over the head and you look at the sclera. So at, uh, as the bilirubin level increases, then it continues progressing downwards. 
it therefore means that by the time you're seeing jaundice on the feet of a neonate on the soles of the feet it means the bilirubin levels are very very high so if you are to just make a glance a, a face value impression of how serious or severe the jaundice is you can just look to what extent has the jaundice uh, progressed downwards so generally it is considered that uh, when jaundice is just up to the level of the face most likely it is at the level of five milligrams per deciliter nothing threatening about that when jaundice progresses up to around the mid abdomen now it means it has increased to about 15 grams per deciliter if it has gone to the soles of the feet then it is as high as 20 grams per milligrams rather per deciliter but I want you to never use this as a means of determining the level of bilirubin. Bilirubin levels must be determined by means of testing. Okay? So this is just at a glance. You see, you can be in a place where you cannot be able to determine the bilirubin levels, which is something that you should do when, uh, when it is indicated. But when you have jaundice extending to the feet, then you know the bilirubin is already very high. If you're still making arrangements to, to have the bilirubin measurements taken or determined by laboratory tests, then already you're making a decision to put this baby in a uh, photo box or to, to institute phototherapy. So that is the value of what you're talking about. But it cannot replace the place of uh, testing for bilirubin levels. So um, you can see the underline. Um, uh, let me do this. You can see this underline. So I'll add another underline there. Over there. So jaundice, like we say, is the first thing that will will be seen in order for you to say there is hyperbilirubinemia. So we are saying that, and um, I will encourage you to go to the hospital with intention, with an objective. You go to the newborn unit or you can go to the neonatal areas in the, in the hospital and you can try to find, are there any babies with jaundice? Of those babies with jaundice, which ones have been diagnosed to have conjugated hyperbilirubinemia? Which ones have been diagnosed to have unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia? Look at how the yellowness looks like. I've tried to use my slides as an example. So you can see this yellow is uh, not very yellow like we know it, but it's yellow as compared to this area perhaps, you know, because it's a little bit different from this area perhaps, you know. So um, the more you look at jaundice on babies, the, uh, the more you understand what I'm going to tell you. So jaundice resulting from indirect, that is unconjugated bilirubin, tends to appear bright yellow or orange, like the first circle I made on my right. And jaundice that is occurring due to obstruction, and like I told you in the beginning, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia or direct reacting hyperbilirubinemia is is, is not neurotoxic, so we are not worried about that, but it is usually an indication of a potentially serious condition, and most of the time it is obstruction. That kind of jaundice will usually appear greenish or muddy yellow. Okay? It's so typical. When you see it, you cannot forget it. So you need to see. You need to go and look for those children and see. So that you can, t because if you do not understand this, you may make a decision to put a baby with conjugated hyperbilirubinemia in the phototherapy box, which is not right. It is wrong. Okay. 
So that, that was just that. So this, this difference is usually obvious only in severe jaundice, okay? Again, not in mild cases of jaundice. So affected children or infants may be lethargic. So that is the other sign that you'll be looking for. Besides the yellowness, you're looking for lethargy and you're looking for ability to feed. Most of these babies, they'll just be yellow. So they have jaundice. And then you're looking at what is the characteristic of the jaundice? Is it the bright yellow orange or is it the greenish or muddy yellow orange? Okay, uh, you, sorry, jaundice. Okay, so that is helping you to differentiate and make a clinical judgment because at the end of the day, you need to make an impression. Okay, remember jaundice is not a diagnosis. The diagnosis is the underlying pathologic cause that becomes the, 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 the diagnosis, okay? Jaundice alone cannot be a diagnosis. Right, so you're looking for lethargy, you're looking for ability to feed, so once they develop poor feeding or inability to feed, that's not a good sign, it's a red flag. Lethargy, not a good sign. If not treated, this can quickly progress to canicturus. By the time a baby who has jaundice or a neonate with jaundice develops an ability to feed lethargy minus other causes, you must be careful and look for presence or absence of canicturus. There is a high chance that this baby could be developing canicturus and that is the worst case scenario in the case of neonatal jaundice. So let's look at the differential diagnosis again. This is just very broad. Now, remember I told you that uh, for you to make a diagnosis of what is causing the jaundice, the one question that you must ask yourself and answer precisely is on which day of life did the jaundice develop? So jaundice that is present at birth or appears within the first day of life which is the first 24 hours of life will usually it is usually requiring immediate attention at this point let me say this uh, while we will come to it huh? at this point let me say this jaundice can take either one of these two directions either it is physiologic or it is pathologic which means it's not physiologic and after looking at the differentials, then we shall go through what therefore is physiologic jaundice, which then separates it from the rest of the jaundice, which is pathologic jaundice or pathological jaundice. All right. But for now, we are saying that for you to have a list of differentials, you must understand what are the causes of jaundice depending on when did it appear. So we are saying jaundice that a baby is born with, it is present at birth, and that which appears within the first day of life is always pathological. It requires immediate attention. The reason is look at the causes. This is hemolytic disease of the, new, of the newborn, erythroblastosis fetalis. Hemolytic disease of the newborn is whereby the mother is... Um, um, of blood group results negative. It could be A, B, or A, B, A, or O. But then their results factor, they don't have it. The mother is results negative. So it so happens that the father is results positive. So we are not talking about the ABO classification or grouping. We are talking about the results grouping. It is the most notorious. While we have ABO incompatibilities, in this case, we are referring to Reza's incompatibility. See, because with Reza's incompatibility, these are, it follows maternal sensitization. It is not like the circulating antibodies that are already there when one is a certain blood group, all right? So now, um, the, the fetus takes the blood group of the father which is Reza's neg uh, positive, and that time the mother is Reza's negative. So the firstborn is usually not affected because that is the time when blood is mixing for the first time. That is the fetal blood and maternal blood during delivery, or this can happen during an abortion. So the first pregnancy usually 
escapes the effects. But once the blood has mixed, um, it then the the the, the fetal RBCs gain access to the maternal circulation, and then the maternal circulation, since they do not have the resource factor, they recognize that as antigenic material, and therefore the mother gets. Uh, um, sensitized. To be sensitized means the immune response is triggered into action and so they produce antibodies against the rhesus factor. In the next pregnancy, should the baby also take up the rhesus factor from the father? And you know, usually we have antibodies crossing the placenta barrier. Some antibodies will usually cross, others will not. Antibodies due to rhesus factor will usually cross the placenta barrier. So they will cross from the mother to the fetus. And once these antibodies go to the fetus, they will now start hemolyzing or killing or destroying the RBCs of the fetus. In this case, therefore, the baby will be born with jaundice. If not, they will develop it soon after birth. Okay, and sometimes this can be so serious and severe that babies can actually be born with severe anemia, they'll be born with severe jaundice, they'll be born with uh, heart failure, and sometimes they die. So this is a very serious thing. But thankfully, there are ways that it can be prevented. So that's not for this lecture. So we are talking about uh, erythroblastosis fetalis or reasons incompatibility is topping the list. You can have concealed hemorrhage in the fetus. You see, when there is hemorrhage, there will be clot formation. And when there is clot formation, the clot will eventually break down. So if there is concealed hemorrhage and uh, with clot formation, then it means that during the breakdown of that clot formation, it will produce bilirubin. Okay, because what is a clot? It's just agglutinated RBCs, you know. So that leads to... The development of jaundice early in life. Then we have sepsis, neonatal sepsis, we have torches, that is intrauterine infections, and we have polycythemia. All these are likely to lead to jaundice appearing at birth or soon after birth. But what tops the list is resource incompatibility. Then we have jaundice that appears on second day or third day of life. So, jaundice that occurs on these two days, either one of them, is predominantly physiologic. And we shall talk about physiologic jaundice. So, any jaundice that occurs first, is first observed on day two or day three of life, that is most likely physiologic. However, that is not the only differential. It could also be familial non-hemolytic icterus, which is also known as krigler naja syndrome. And it could also be due to uh, an early onset breastfeeding jaundice. So you remember the breastfeeding jaundice that is due to delayed feeding or suboptimal feeding? There you are. Then number three, jaundice that appears after the third day and within the first week of life. So we are talking about jaundice on day four, day five, day six, day seven. All right. Most commonly will be uh, due to bacterial infection, that is neonatal sepsis, or they could just have a urinary tract into any, any infection anywhere. So we can break it down and say uh, sepsis, we can say UTI, we can say torches. It can be any on that spectrum. The point is infection. Okay. Then we have jaundice that it is first noted after the first week of life. So you see, we've talked about jaundice at birth and within the first 24 hours of life. We've talked about jaundice occurring on day two and three, which is predominantly physiologic or due to the breastfeeding or due to the familial non-hemolytic icterus, the krigler naja syndrome. We've talked about jaundice now, which occurs from day four up to one week of life. And we have said mainly it will be infection. And the, what kind of infection? Intrauterine or neonatal sepsis or anything else. 
infections. Now we are talking about jaundice that occurs for the first time after the first week of life. Now these are another set of differentials. So again, it could be due to breast milk. So you see the word has changed. Now we are not saying breastfeeding jaundice. Now this is breast milk jaundice and we shall see the difference in a short while. It could be septicemia. So here we're talking about neonatal sepsis. It could be due to congenital atresia or porosity of the bile duct. So in this case of uh, the, the, this bullet, we are referring to obstruction jaundice. So this will be um, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. All right. Hepatitis, it could be galactosemia, hypothyroidism, congenital hemolytic anemia, or possibly a crisis from other hemolytic anemias. So these are the various um, uh, differentials. Besides that, it also depends. As now, you see, you've taken your history. Remember, neonate, uh, a neonate is um, up to one month of age. And by extension, we may include the young infant up to the first 60 days of life because the things affect them in a similar way. All right. So you may be meeting this baby on uh, um, third week of life, 22nd day, perhaps. And uh, you, you have a history. You know when did the jaundice begin? It was the so-so of life. So you have your differentials already you're thinking about. And then maybe this jaundice has lasted a week or two. That now again shapes the way you look at jaundice and helps you with the differential. Okay. So let's see. We call it persistent jaundice. Okay. Jaundice that occurred on a certain day of life. So you have its differential. But then it has persisted for so long. Now, that introduces another thought line, all right? So here we're saying jaundice persisting during the first month of life will usually suggest hyperalimentation associated cholestasis. So these are babies who are predominantly fed using the intravenous fruit. Okay? Inspicated bile syndrome, that word is mouth feeling for me. Hepatitis, cytomegalic inclusion disease, syphilis, toxoplasma, and familial non-hemolytic icterus. The list is long. Congenital atresia of the bile ducts, galactosemia. Now, it is important for you to note that uh, on rare conditions, you may have physiologic jaundice persisting for long. Because when we shall look at physiologic jaundice, you realize that it usually does not go beyond one week. All right? But then in some instances, it can go beyond one week, which we call persistent jaundice. So this can occur, or it has been observed mainly in uh, babies with hypothyroidism or those with pyloric stenosis. Okay. Having said that, then we can now talk about physiologic jaundice. Uh, we have looked at jaundice generally. Generally. And remember we said for physiologic jaundice, we are referring to jaundice that showed up on day two or day three of life. Anything outside day two and day three of life cannot be physiologic by all standards. At this point, let me also say this, that, that the jaundice has occurred on day two or day three of life. It does not expressly therefore mean that it has got to be physiologic, no. Usually it will be physiologic, but we are saying that also other causes can pre still, other comorbidities can still exist, but predominantly it will be physiologic in nature. However, as we shall look at what therefore defines physiologic jaundice, if the jaundice does not fit this description, then it becomes pathologic, even if it occurred on day two or day three of life. I want you to get that very clearly. So we are saying that under normal circumstances, the level of direct reacting bilirubin, that is the unconjugated bilirubin, in the umbilical cord serum is up to 3 milligrams per deciliter. Okay? And this level rises steadily, but the rate at which it rises per day does not exceed 5 milligrams per 
deciliter, which means if you're doing serial testings to check the serum bilirubin levels, and you find that the rate of increase in bilirubin exceeds 5 milligrams per deciliter, then it means it is not physiologic because the normal increase in rate, the normal increase in bilirubin is not more than 5 milligrams per deciliter. So that's one thing you must remember. So point two, we are saying, therefore, jaundice becomes visible on the second to third day. At this point, let me say this. The moment you see jaundice on the skin, on the mucous membranes, it means that the serum bilirubin levels has gone beyond five, is at least five on the lower side or more. So by the time now, the jaundice on day two, because we are saying that the average rate of increase is five, up to less than five milligrams. But then on day two, day three, Obviously, now it is maybe 7 or 10, you know, and now jaundice is visible. So usually uh, by second day, third day of life, uh, it has peaked. And on the sec uh, second and fourth days at 5 to 6 milligrams deciliters and decreases to below 2 milligrams per deciliter between the fifth and seventh days of life. You see, so we are saying if jaundice is visible from about 5 and above, around 6, and uh, we are saying that uh, the normal increase in a normal baby is less than five. So it means by day two, day three, obviously, cumulatively, it is now beyond five. But then, and that is when it peaks, it's at its peak levels, and then we're able to see it. So, so then it starts reducing by day four and five, and by day seven, it is already below 2 milligrams per deciliter and we can no longer see jaundice on the skin. That is the pattern of physiologic jaundice. And you remember I told you that its pattern is that it does not persist beyond one week. That means even if it started on day 2 or day 3 of life and it is persisting into the second week, then you are, you are supposed to be looking for other causes. Could there be pyloric stenosis? Could there be uh, hypothyroidism? Could there be another thing? Could there be an infection also? You know, so jaundice associated with these changes is considered physiologic. It is believed to be the result of increased bilirubin production due to the breakdown of the, uh, you remember the HBF I talked about, which the baby is really trans trans transiting from to HBA. And remember I told you that HBF has a shorter lifespan compared to HBA. Okay. HBF has a shorter lifespan compared to HBA. And so its, its breakdown is also faster. And so it presents a heavy load of bilirubin to be conjugated to the liver and the liver is not able to handle the load. Hence, the baby develops jaundice. But this is a physiologic process. It has no pathology associated with it. Okay. So what are some of the risk factors that are associated with the development of physiologic jaundice? Because you realize it is not all children or all neonates who will develop physiologic jaundice, even as much as we are saying that uh, bilirubin levels will be increasing at a certain rate. Not all will develop jaundice. Some will be able to cope with that load. Okay. But there are certain circumstances or situations when they pre-exist, then they predispose the baby to developing physiologic jaundice. Don't you say physiologic without any pathology involved, then it is very, very benign. It is not associated with any complications. So my uh, baby is born to diabetic mothers. So if the mother has diabetes, the baby is unlikely to present with uh, physiologic jaundice. Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Native American babies are prone to that. Prematurity, for obvious reasons, remember, the, almost everything about a preterm is premature, you know, and that includes the functionalities of the liver, okay? The ability to transport bilirubin to the liver, the ability to take up the bilirubin and transport it across the 
the interface between the plasma and uh, the hepatocytes. The ability of the enzymes to conjugate bilirubin, ability to excrete. Everything is compromised because of their prematurity state or the premature state. Drugs. High altitude, you know, high altitude is associated with um, the higher you go, the lesser oxygen concentration there is, the more the body is um, is, is in a increased production mode. And of course, when that is happening, it therefore means that even the amount of RBCs being broken down will also be high. If it is high, then we also have high levels of bilirubin. Polycythemia doesn't need an explanation male gender studies have shown that male uh, babies tend to uh, be more prone to developing physiologic jaundice trisomy 21 this is down syndrome uh, any reason for bruising or injuries cutaneous bruising that is bad injuries cephalohematoma a very common occurrence in our setting that will predispose to jaundice physiologically of course oxytocin induction remember we mentioned this breastfeeding all right delayed breastfeeding delayed initiation of feeding weight loss which again is associated with dehydration and when we are talking about growth and development you realize that uh, in the first uh, 10 days or so of life a baby will usually lose weight they become more dehydrated you know and uh, then around two weeks of life they regain their birth weight okay we have delayed bowel movement and a sibling who had physiologic genetics that means if a sibling had physiologic jaundice chances are another and another will is likely to have that is what studies have shown so therefore how do we make a diagnosis of physiologic jaundice so diagnosis of physiologic jaundice, I like to call it a diagnosis of exclusion because you have to exclude any other cause of jaundice, be left with no other cause, no pathologic cause, and now call it physiologic jaundice. So the diagnosis of physiologic jaundice can be established only by ruling out non-causes of jaundice on the basis of the history and clinical and laboratory findings. So you take your history, you do your physical examination, uh, the jaundice is not extensive, it is not increasing at an abnormally high rate, you know, it is not persisting, it is not associated with any other signs, things like that, and then you make a diagnosis of physiologic jaundice. Um, we will take a break. You can drop your questions in the comments section and uh, I will look at them and try to respond to them as much as it is possible. Now we can look about the rest of the jaundice, which is pathologic jaundice. So either jaundice is physiologic or it is pathologic in nature. We have already looked at what describes physiologic jaundice. We have ruled out every other possibility and now we are left with nothing but physiologic jaundice. No, in the absence of that, any other jaundice that occurs on day one at birth, after day two and three of life going forward, it is persisting. All that is known as physiologic jaundice, uh, uh, pathologic jaundice rather. Okay, so, so pathologic jaundice is considered number one when the time of appearance, duration or pattern of bilirubin concentration varies significantly from that of physiologic jaundice as we have seen. That, that means that um, the, the, the occurrence did, did not coincide with day two or day three of life. The increase in bilirubin rate at per day is more than five you know it is extending it, it, it is extending rapidly you know it is associated with other signs and symptoms then that cannot be physiologic but pathologic so if the cause is compatible with physiologic jaundice but other reasons exist to suspect special risks from the neurotoxicity of unconjugated bilirubin what this means is this that yes like i said earlier the jaundice may have shown up on day two or day three of life but then there are other coexisting symptomatology other risk factors that increase the susceptibility of neurotoxicity that becomes pathological jaundice so many of these infants have an associated risk factor 
uh, particularly prematurity or low birth weight. And when you learned about low birth weight, you also saw that they are more prone to developing jaundice and the severe forms of jaundice, including canicterus, okay, or hyperbilirubinemia, including canicterus. So prematurity and low birth weight are a special category of babies with very many potential complications that we must take care of. And one of them is jaundice, hyperbilirubinemia. So even if a preterm developed jaundice on day two or day, day three, still there is a likelihood that they may progress and still suffer from neurotoxicity, all right? So generally, we usually search to determine the cause of jaundice in any baby that fits this category. If the jaundice appears within the first at birth or first 24 to 36 hours of life, if the rate of increase of bilirubin is higher than 5 milligrams per deciliter per day when you do your serial bilirubin level testing. If the serum bilirubin is greater than 12 in a full-term baby, particularly when there is no risk factor or more than 14 in a preterm infant. Okay? So you're doing your serum bilirubin now, it is 12, that should be evaluated further. You are doing your serum bilirubin now, or two days ago, but it was less than 12, but the rate at which is, it is increasing is more than 5 milligrams per deciliter. That is a baby who must be evaluated. Jaundice persisting after 10 to 14 days, that is two weeks of life, call it persistent jaundice, and then direct reacting bilirubin, which is greater than 2 milligrams per deciliter at any time. So remember, when we are testing for bilirubin levels, uh, you always ask for total bilirubin level and direct reacting bilirubin level. So you do the math, you minus, and then you get the level of the indirect reacting bilirubin levels. So then you can now say this is predominantly um, direct reacting hyperbilirubinemia or predominantly indirect reacting uh, hyperbilirubinemia. If you want to use simpler terms, then you can say direct, uh, predominantly conjugated or predominantly unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia because it helps you with sifting through the differential diagnosis. So when you do the total and the direct and indirect, and you find that the direct bilirubin is more than two grams per deciliter at any time, then um, you must evaluate that baby. Five factors. So other factors suggesting a pathologic cause of jaundice are a family history of the same. If the baby is pale, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, all those will suggest um, uh, hemolysis. If they are pale and they are jaundiced, then that is highly suggestive of hemolysis. Um, uh, if the baby has been subjected to phototherapy and the phototherapy is not helping in reducing the jaundice, or, then that is uh, a sign of pathologic jaundice. Because remember, even those who present with physiologic jaundice, the, the level may be high and it may necessitate the use of phototherapy. Okay, But then if you put a baby in a phototherapy box and the phototherapy is not helping in reducing the jaundice, then there is an underlying pathologic cause that you must evaluate to find out. If they're vomiting, if they're lethargic, if they're feeding poorly, these are signs we've already mentioned, okay? So we are saying any jaundice that is associated with other factors, other associated symptoms and signs. Excessive weight loss, apnea. And you see, when you're talking about excessive weight loss, I'll take you back to growth and development, whereby we are saying, at what rate do the babies lose weight? Yes, we know they lose weight uh, within the first uh, one week or so of life, but then up to around 10 days, and then by the time they are two weeks old, they have regained their birth weight, but then there is the excessive weight loss. Apnea, bradycardia, you know, any abnormality in the vital signs, and including temperature. Babies should never be left to be cold, and if they develop hypothermia, then that's 
uh, a danger sign. Light colored stools, this would indicate obstruction, dark urine again, obstruction and signs of connectoras. So signs of connectoras, connectoras just refers to encephalopathy due to hyperbilirubinemia. So they'll have CNS manifestation, loss of neonatal reflexes, you know, uh, spasticity, hypotonia and things like that, okay? Things that indicate or suggest increased intracranial pressures. All those are CNS manifestations. They are suggestive of um, connectoras. So any baby who presents with all of these is likely uh, is having pathologic jaundice and should be evaluated further in order for you to get a diagnosis. So the, the greatest risk associated with hyperbilirubinemia, like we said, is the development of neurotoxicity, which is connectoras, aka bilirubin encephalopathy. And this happens when the levels of unconjugated bilirubin are high. And of course, it is compounded by the presence of the factors we talked about. We talked about factors that reduce the retention of bilirubin in plasma. We talked about factors that increase the risk of uh, the, 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 the nervous cells to bilirubin toxicity. Factors that will usually increase the permeability of the blood-brain barrier to um, uh, to, to the bilirubin, you know, and causing it to access the nervous tissue. So all these are compounding factors, okay? If they have acidosis, if they're asphyxiated, they are in fact, they have infection, you know, all these things. So connector, the connectors can develop at lower levels of uh, bilirubin. You know, we are saying that high levels of unconjugated bilirubin are what are associated with uh, development of connectors. That's not the only thing. The bilirubin levels can still be lower than what you consider the threshold for developing connectors. But if the fetus, or not the fetus really, if the baby is preterm, if they are as, as, as asphyxiated, if they have hemorrhage, if they are hemolyzing, you know, if they, they are having uh, adverse effects of drugs, which, you know, compete with the bilirubin for binding sites, whether in plasma or in the liver. All these compounding factors, like I mentioned, will contribute towards developing connectoras, all right? But we shall talk about connectoras a little bit later. So having looked at what therefore defines pathologic jaundice, we are saying that anything that does not fit the physiologic jaundice that we have described and also presence of jaundice plus other coexisting symptoms and signs all right so we talked about that now uh, earlier on we talked about milk and uh, jaundice so we've already talked about breastfeeding jaundice so let us uh, see what other aspects of breastfeeding are associated with jaundice so initially let's just say this that breast milk jaundice develops in about 2% of breastfed term infants after one week of life. Breast milk jaundice. It's different from breastfeeding jaundice. So breast milk is about breast milk. Breastfeeding jaundice is about feeding. I think that's a very easy way to remember. So breast milk jaundice will usually occur in up to 2% of babies who are breastfed. And this deduction was from a study or studies done and compared babies who are breastfed uh, with those who are formula fed, you know. And it was found that in the breast uh, fed infants, up to 2% developed, which means that uh, there is a chance, there's a higher chance. It means there is something about the breast milk that predisposes babies to jaundice. There's something about the mother's milk, some mothers, which is associated with the conjugation of bilirubin in the gut. So maximum bilirubin concentrations can be as high as 10 to 30. And now 30 is pretty high milligrams per deciliter, which are usually reached during the second to third week of life. 
third week of life. Notice we are talking about these are jaundices that are presenting after the first week of life for the first time. You see, we are talking about seventh day. So it will be ridiculous for you to talk of breast milk jaundice when the jaundice showed up on day four of life. It's pretty ridiculous. It will not make sense. Okay. So if breastfeeding is continued, so this is a baby who has developed breast milk jaundice. We are saying that there is something about the mother's milk that is predisposing these babies to uh, jaundice. Now, there are two scenarios here. There are those who will continue breastfeeding and then we see what happens. And what happens when you stop or you cease the breastfeeding and what happens? So if breastfeeding is continued, the hyperbilirubinemia gradually decreases and may then persist for about another 10 weeks, but at lower levels. So it doesn't disappear. If they continue breastfeeding, remember the reason they're having the jaundice is the breast milk. But then you continue breastfeeding them exclusively as is recommended. So the jaundice, uh, the bilirubin will gradually decrease okay so remember it is peaking to very high levels 30 within the second and third weeks of life so you do nothing and you let the mother continue breastfeeding after a while they will begin to decrease from 30 and will persist for even 10 weeks this is about two and a half months but at lower levels the other way, if breastfeeding is discontinued, usually the cell and bilirubin drops rapidly, okay? And it reaches normal levels within very few days. Now, it has been shown that when that happens and breastfeeding is reinstated, so you cease the breastfeeding for like two, three days, then you reinstate it for some reason, the bilirubin does not rise again. So let's see what this slide is saying. Cessation of breastfeeding for one to two days and substitution of formula for breast milk results in a rapid decline in serum bilirubin, after which nursing can be resumed without a return of the hyperbilirubinemia to its previously high levels. So this is something you may consider. Um, so you're weighing. Um, maybe you have no means of providing uh, substitute feeding or formula feed for one to two days, you know. Um, so in that case, you may just carry on breastfeeding and uh, after the third week, the, the levels will begin to drop. They'll persist, but at low levels, high but low levels, up to around two and a half months. But if you have um, means to substitute for at least 48 hours, then you can cease the breastfeeding for around two days and you will observe the bilirubin dropping rapidly and then now you can take them back to exclusive breastfeeding. And um, usually the, 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 what studies have shown is that once that happens, for some reason, the bilirubin does not rise again. Okay, So if indicated, phototherapy may be of benefit. Remember we are saying that the bilirubin levels can rise as high as 30 gram, milligrams per deciliter. In that case, these babies will usually need um, some phototherapy because the jaundice also is unconjugated in nature of the, of the bilirubin. So these infants have no other sign of illness. However, connectorus has been reported in a few cases. So we are saying, uh, remember first of all, this jaundice is developing after the first week of life. It is associated with breast milk, you know, and you know, we are saying that these children will usually have no other sign of illness. Okay. So they have no other sign of illness except the high jaundice, the, the high bilirubin levels, which we have seen how they behave depending on what you do. So the cause is usually unclear, but it has been thought that some milks, or some milk from some mothers contains a glucuronidase that may be responsible for the jaundice. Glucuronidase, its job is to deconjugate conjugated bilirubin. Okay. So this syndrome should be distinguished from an early onset heightened unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, that is uh, the breastfeeding jaundice. So remember, 
the first difference is one is due to breast milk, one is due to breastfeeding. So the, the breastfeeding one is delayed or suboptimal feeding. The breast milk one is the presence of the breast milk. Breast feeding jaundice occurs early in life, around day two. Okay. Uh, breast, breast milk jaundice occurs after the first week of life. All right. So that is just a few distinctions. So hyperbilirubinemia of more than 12 gram, milligrams per deciliter develops in 13% of breastfed infants in the first week of life and may be due to decreased milk intake with dehydration or reduced caloric intake. So breastfeeding jaundice is purely due to breastfeeding, delayed, suboptimal, dehydration, and things like that. But breast milk jaundice is due to breast milk, uh, uh, an enzyme that is thought to be present in the breast milk that deconjugates the bilirubin and increases the intrahepatic circulation. It is not associated with any other uh, physical symptoms or signs. Uh, it, the, the bilirubin can be as high as 30 milligrams per deciliter, but in a few cases, it has been associated with development of connectors. But again, like I said, the development of connectors develop, uh, depends not only on the level of bilirubin, but also other coexisting factors. So giving supplements of glucose water to breastfed infants is associated with higher bilirubin levels, in part because of reduced intake of the higher caloric density breast milk. So. Um, in infant feeding, we'll see that uh, we insist on um, babies getting breast milk as soon after birth as possible. If for whatever reason the, we cannot get breast milk to feed the baby, either the mother is very sick, maybe they've been anesthetized, they are not awake, they don't have milk for whatever reason, you know, don't give them glucose water. No, it is better to give them a recommended uh, age appropriate formula feed rather than giving them glucose water so this is something you should never do okay so frequent breastfeeding rooming in with night feeding and discouraging five percent dextrose or water supplementation may reduce the incidence of early breastfeeding jaundice so there you are you now know how to differentiate breast milk and breastfeeding jaundice. Both refer to uh, jaundice associated with breast milk. Just a sentence about atresia of the bile ducts. This will usually be associated with conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. It does not show up early in life and usually is associated with persistent jaundice. And the jaundice, when you look at it on examination, it will be the olive green one or the musky orange, uh, yellow, okay? That kind of uh, color. Usually the urine will be dark in nature and the stools will be pale in nature. Okay, in appearance. So all such infants should have an immediate diagnostic evaluation, including determination of direct reacting bilirubin. Usually they will need surgery. Okay. Having said that, now let us talk about the most dreaded outcome of uh, unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, which is connectoras. This makes jaundice very important. Remember, in our opening statement, we said jaundice is a common occurrence in our setup among neon the neonatal population, and it is usually benign in nature. It is not serious, you know. But it can be potentially harmful because of the ability to become toxic to the nervous tissue. So let's talk about it a little bit. So we are saying that connectoras or bilirubin encephalopathy is a neurologic syndrome resulting from the deposition of unconjugated bilirubin in the basal ganglia and brainstem nuclei. So this is unconjugated bilirubin gaining access into the neural tissue and being deposited there. So the brain is jaundiced. Okay. 
So the pathogenesis of Carnicterus is multifactorial and it includes the following. One, the ability, so the presence of albumin and the ability of the albumin to bind to the circulating bilirubin for transportation to the liver. Number two, the ability to cross the interface between um, the plasma and the blood brain barrier and neuronal susceptibility to injury. So the unbound bilirubin is the one that is not being transported to the liver. And it is the one, and remember we're saying it is highly, highly fat soluble. So it is easily available for um, crossing via the blood brain barrier to intoxicate the nervous tissue. Previously, we looked at some of the things that will usually increase the toxicity of bilirubin to the brain. So the following affect the permeability of the blood brain barrier thereby increasing the risk of connectors. Number one, disruption of di by disease, any disease, asphyxia and other factors, and prematurity. Premature babies, they are prone to this, you know. They have a lot of free circulating bilirubin with the high fatty acids, you know, and uh, they, are, they are feeding poorly, which means they have free circulating fatty acids, you know. Their brain, uh, the BBB is, is not mature, so it is Easy, it is easy for the bilirubin to cross to the basal ganglia and cause neurotoxicity. So that is how prematurity relates with carnicterus. Okay, and remember also the preterms uh, among the complications is hypoglycemia, hypothermia, you know, and we looked at all these things and remember they were factors that increased the availability of um, unconjugated bilirubin to to the brain. So the precise blood level above which unconjugated bilirubin will be neurotoxic is not predictable. So you cannot say that because the bilirubin is not yet 20 milligrams per deciliter, the risk of uh, connectors is, is low. No, the risk can increase incredibly incre uh, even at 15 depending on what else is going on. If the baby is acidotic, even as low as 20, they can get connectors. So connectors is rare in healthy term infants and in the absence of hemolysis, if the serum levels are under 25 milligrams per deciliter. In previously healthy, predominantly breastfed term infants, connectors has been reported when bilirubin levels exceed 30 milligrams per deciliter, although the range is wide even up to 50. So here we are saying that the exact level cutoff for bilirubin, um, which predisposes a baby to uh, connectors, cannot be uh, determined. It can be high, and some babies will still not develop connectors even if it is high, but it can still be lower than 20 or 25, and the baby can still develop connectors. So you have to look at everything in totality. Nonetheless, the less mature the infant, the greater the susceptibility to connectors. So clinical manifestations, early signs may be subtle and you may not be able to distinguish them from those of other diseases like neonatal sepsis, like asphyxia, hypoglycemia, intracranial hemorrhage. For instance, neonatal sepsis, one of the causes, one of the things that causes an index of suspicion is inability to breastfeed lethargy. And a baby who is jaundiced and is developing connectors, one of the things they're likely to develop is lethargy and inability to feed. So you can see the overlap, okay? Asphyxiated babies, you know, they can convulse. Hypoglycemic babies convulse. And here we find that even babies with connectors will have seizures. 
babies with intra, uh, intracranial hemorrhage will have increased intracranial pressure. How do such babies behave? They will have a, a shrill cry. They'll have a high-pitched cry. You know, they'll be apneic. So you, you see all these overlaps. When they are preterm and asphyxiated, they can actually, you know, sometimes when they are premature, and they're asphyxiated, instead of responding by, uh, by hyperventilating or have, having increased respiratory rate, they respond by apnea, okay? Or they can have respiratory distress. So how do you differentiate uh, RDS? When you see RDS, it could be pneumonia, it could be any other thing, you know? So the presence of connectors and its signs can, the signs can, can overlap, easily overlap with other uh, neonatal conditions and it can sometimes if you don't have an index of suspicion it can be difficult to distinguish and therefore it can be missed okay so you have to be on the lookout you really have to be on the lookout you really have to have an index of suspicion you have a preterm or you have a very sick baby who is also having jaundice and is developing all these things you need to consider can possibility of connectors and do something about it Okay, so these are the signs. Early, uh, early signs will include lethargy, poor feeding, and loss of the neonatal reflexes, particularly the moral reflex. Okay, so this is the moral reflex. Among the neonatal reflexes, the moral reflex is one of those that you will want to really check out. So they'll be apneic, they'll, they'll be very sick looking, they'll have diminished reflexes. Generally, they'll, they'll be in respiratory distress. If they're not apneic, they could be in respiratory distress. They'll be opistotonic, and I'll show you what is opistotonous. They'll have a bulging fountanelle, which really looks like meningitis, remember? Okay, seizures, again, CNS disease, and uh, the kind of cry that they give you, again, indicates high increased intracranial pressure. So you can see the overlapping is, is real. So uh, as the disease advances, then they can become, they have really serious convulsions. Uh, they clench their feet, you know, they become stiff. So now they're becoming spastic or they can, as it progresses again, they become hypotonic and they get this inconsolable cry. Now, these are some of the things that you look at when you come to do pediatrics. Then we take you through how to classify um, how to score a baby who presents with connectors, you know, but we shall not go into that at this point. That is not for the scope of this lecture. But for you, it is important because hypotonia will be one of the manifestations. This is how you can demonstrate hypotonia. Hypotonic babies are just floppy, okay? So if you hold them the way you're seeing on these pictures, this is just how floppy they fall, okay? Look at this. Moral reflex is lost, okay? Now, this is uh, opistotonic posturing. You can see the arching of the trunk, okay? You can see the clenching of the fist, okay? Now, I want you to go and look at uh, two posturings. We have the decorticate and decerebate. I want you to go and look at the differences, okay? Yeah. But this is opistotonous. So you have determined that there is jaundice, there is uh, coexisting comorbidities, there are other signs that uh, uh, highly suggest pathologic uh, causes of jaundice. Now you need to do your investigations and have a diagnosis. The first and foremost thing um, uh, I want to say is that there is no particular investigation that is standard. You have to decide on which a test you want to do based on how is your baby presenting and uh, what is your index of suspicion because you can't just do everything for everybody. So among the investigations that you can do are listed here but you pick them according to how the baby has presented and what you're suspecting. So you have blood group uh, both for mother and baby especially if you're dealing with uh, results uh, or blood group incompatibilities and here we talked about Jaundice that appears very early in life, the first 24 to 36 hours of life or baby being born with <coughs> jaundice already. Excuse me. Uh -huh. 
So you always measure bilirubin levels, total and direct. Full blood count, IT ratios, this will uh, just to look for, you know, peripheral blood film. You're looking for, is there a possibility of infection? Is there ongoing inflammation? What is the blood picture like? Is there an hemolytic process going on? Of course, blood cultures and CRP, you're looking for evidence of infection. And then if it is indicated when the mother is results negative, then you may want to do a Coombs test. So this is how you can, there are three ways to measure or to assess for jaundice. Uh, we have the Kramer scale. This is just by visualization. And like I said, visualization just gives you uh, a face value at the time when you're looking at the baby. But the real uh, test is, the, the ultimate goal is to do bilirubin testing. Okay, so let's see. So this is the Kramer scale. If you, you come across it, you should not uh, um, look lost. So like we said, uh, jaundice tends to progress from the head to, to the toe. So you see number one, it is usually around five, four to six milligrams per deciliter. So that is uh, the head and neck. By the time you're, it's coming to the upper trunk, uh, but above the umbilicus, it would be around 10 max. And then by the time it's coming to the lower trunk and, uh, you know, around the thigh region, below the umbilicus and around the thighs, up to about 14. If it is to the arms and legs, that is where you can see the uh, arms like this and the legs is about 18. And by the time it's at the soles of the feet, uh, and the palms, that is number five, is about 20. So the, the, the more you can see the joint is going downwards, the higher the bilirubin. But like we said, this is not uh, the ultimate measure of bilirubin. You only do it, um, let's say. The Kramer scale is based on a 1969 study of 108 full-term infants, which found that bilirubin concentrations were correlated to five specific dermal zones. At 24 and 48, the infant's skin was blanched using uh, the thumb, okay? So this is just a, a quick assessment when you're doing your clinical examination. You can do your rapid assessment and uh, as you're taking your blood to take to measure bilirubin, you, uh, you could be making some important decisions regarding maybe considering phototherapy and things like that or even considering possibility of exchange transfusion, even as you begin to do your in. So the next uh, thing you wanna do, if you're waiting to do uh, serum bilirubin levels, you can do what we call transcutaneous bilirubin levels. So the transcutaneous bilirubin, TCB, uh, is more accurate in babies who are more than 35 weeks okay so that means if your baby is 30 weeks then uh, uh, TCB may not be very nice for you it's not a good indicator all right and uh, we're also saying that uh, weeks are more than 24 hours old so you cannot use this test on babies or newborns, so to speak. So it relates the amount of light absorption by bilirubin to the concentration of bilirubin in the skin. So the amount of light absorption of bilirubin by this gadget is what estimates for you the bilirubin. So it is said that if babies are less than 35 weeks, not, uh, not a, a good idea, not a good option. And of course, if they are still, newborns okay okay so what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of this method uh, one of the main advantages is that it's not invasive in nature and you can easily use it over the sternum or the, or the forehead uh, it gives you instant real-time results it is not costly and it is a viable alternative 
where perhaps you don't have a lab that will estimate or measure the bilirubin for you and uh, you need to make some serious decisions before perhaps you send the baby elsewhere. Disadvantages, it's affected by gestational age. Remember, you remember we say you cannot use it on babies who are less than 35 weeks of gestation and who are uh, newborns, okay? And then it has been found to overestimate the bilirubin level, particularly in babies who happen to have dark skin. And then it is not recommended if the jaundice is prolonged, if it is conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, or if the baby has been on phototherapy, uh, or the baby has already had an exchange blood transfusion. So those are the only times that you cannot use um, the transcutaneous bilirubin check. Then we have the total serum bilirubin, which is abbreviated as TSB. So the total serum bilirubin, this is a blood test and it is the gold standard for diagnosing hyperbilirubinemia. Do whatever else that you can do or do, but this is the gold standard for oh, measuring or uh, determining the bilirubin levels. So do total serum bilirubin immediately for any baby with suspected or obvious jaundice who presents with jaundice in the first 24 hours of life, okay? And also preterms. This should be repeated within six hours for all babies, particularly when the levels are 1 to 50 millimoles below the phototherapy threshold. So this is, uh, you, you have to do random or serial bilirubin testing for you to be able to monitor your baby well, particularly when the levels are less than uh, 50 millimoles below um, the threshold for phototherapy. Again, you use the same uh, for monitoring babies who are undergoing phototherapy. So you do the total serum bilirubin four to six hourly until the rise of serum bilirubin is controlled. Then you do it every 12 hours or 24 hours. Now, uh, guides on when to stop phototherapy. So, you stop when the total serum bilirubin is greater than 50 micromoles per liter below the line and recheck in 12-24 hours for rebound hyperbilirubinemia. Now, these things, I'm going to refer you to the, the comprehensive uh, newborn care protocols, Kenya. And I'll refer you to specific pages where you are going to read about these things and understand them as recommended, okay? So treatment of hyperbilirubinemia. Um, regardless of the goal, the therapy is to prevent the concentration of unconjugated bilirubin in the blood from reaching levels at which neurotoxicity can occur. So the point here is, in any baby who presents with jaundice, the point here is you want to prevent neurotoxicity from occurring. That is the, the, the aim, the gold standard. So it is recommended that phototherapy and if necessary, or if unsuccessful, exchange transfusion be used to achieve this goal. So number one is phototherapy, and number two is exchange transfusion. Remember why are we concerned about uh, jaundice is because the unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia is highly neurotoxic. And so the goal, the, the goal of treatment is to prevent neurotoxicity. So how do we at least do that? Um, to address jaundice on its own per se, it is phototherapy and exchange transfusion. So when identified, now, the underlying cause of the jaundice should be treated. So, besides addressing the jaundice, presence of the hyperbilirubinemia, you must address the cause. Because if you don't address the cause, the bilirubin will still keep rising. So, if it is sepsis, you treat it. 
If it is dehydration, you make sure uh, it is corrected. If they're not feeding, you make sure they're not feeding. If they're acidotic, you correct the acidosis. If they're hypoxic, you make sure you're supplementing oxygen, and so on and so forth. So physiologic factors, the factors that increase the risk of neurologic disease or damage should also be treated, okay? So here we are talking about what are the other compounding factors that increase the toxicity of bilirubin to the uh, nervous tissue or the brain cells. So you must address those ones as well as much as you are address addressing the jaundice. Okay. So generally assess for jaundice in bright light, natural light. If possible, check the eyes blanched skin on nose and the soles of the feet. So jaundice should not be examined under artificial lighting. You need to examine jaundice under natural light. Always measure serum bilirubin if the, uh, the baby is less than uh, one day if they are newborns and if they are critically, uh, clinically uh, moderate or severe. Any jaundice in a newborn age less than 24 hours needs further investigations. It is very serious. So then, you need to refer early, especially if they are newborns, and they, that means they have developed jaundice within the first day of life. And the hospital where you are, you cannot be able to provide phototherapy or perform exchange transfusion. You may be skilled but the hospital may not have the equipment. Or you may have a hospital with equipment, but you're not skilled, so you still need to refer. If bilirubin measure is unavailable, you need to start for a phototherapy under these conditions. One, if you have a well baby with jaundice that is easily visible on the sole of the feet, that means it is 20 plus milligrams per deciliter. So we are saying, when can you start phototherapy without measuring uh, bilirubin because you don't have the means or the ability to do so where you're working? So any time or well baby with jaundice that can be seen on the soles of the feet, uh, a preterm baby with any visible jaundice. So for preterms, it doesn't matter how far the jaundice is. If they have a tinge of jaundice, then you need to, any visible jaundice, they need to be under the photo. In a baby with easily visible jaundice and inability to feed or other signs of neurological impairment. So these are babies who are already on their journey to or they are at risk of developing carnicterus. Okay. And for this, you need to consider early uh, um, exchange transfusion. So in infants with hemolytic disease, you need to take care not to um, overheat them. Uh, because they can also develop anemia, which may require transfusion. Okay, you need to stop phototherapy when bilirubin is at 50 micromoles per liter below the phototherapy threshold. The phototherapy threshold, you will also see it in the uh, comprehensive newborn care protocols. So this is where I want you to go and check it out. You'll go to the Comprehensive Newborn Care Protocol, pages 31 to 37, and you'll get all these uh, details of when to, to, to start your phototherapy and so on and so forth. All right. So this is uh, phototherapy. And uh, we, are, we are looking at uh, the different lighting systems. This is the fluorescent lamps, and this is the LED uh, emitting light. So uh, comparing the two, you find that the LED emitting lights are better for providing phototherapy. They have better outcomes. They have a longer uh, lifespan, uh, and they, they don't heat, they don't overheat the baby. So you can see the heat generated by the LED is less compared to the fluorescent. You can see the durability is longer, is uh, almost double uh, the fluorescent. And uh, the energy consumption is also less for the LED. So technologically, um, uh, what is now being found on the market is uh, a high recommendation for the LED uh, lights as compared to the fluorescent, which we used to use before. So, when you want to provide phototherapy, 
there are things that you must consider. Remember, this is light. The baby is under the light. So you must do some protective measures to make sure, and while at the same time making sure they are, you know, benefiting from the phototherapy maximally. So the first thing is to protect the eyes. So you need to shield the eyes. So you cover the eyes. And the way you cover the eyes, you make sure that the padding is not very tight because you can injure the eye. And again, don't make it very loose so that uh, when the baby is able to open the eyes, that they can get some, uh, you know, um, scratches on their cornea and they can end up with the corneal ulcerations, which then can lead to scarring of the cornea. So you need to be careful. Now, you need to just remove them periodically when the baby, for example, when you remove the baby from the photo box, you can remove also the covering so that they can also enjoy the light uh, when they are breastfeeding. So uh, that is what we are saying. So you, the baby must be naked because phototherapy works on the skin. Okay. So there's a photo oxidation that occurs on the skin when light hits the skin. And that helps to turn the, the fat soluble bilirubin on the skin and it converts it to um, a, a water soluble uh, bilirubin which is then easily excreted so you place the baby close to the light so it should not be very far where the baby is placed between where the lighting is and where the baby is should be maximum 30 uh, 45 centimeters but uh, don't make it also too close because then you can cause overheating so 30 to 45 centimeters is recommended Okay, so the more light power the baby receives, the better the outcome. And the closer the distance uh, are okay if the baby is not overheating, especially rapid if, if the rapid effect is needed. So we are saying that <clears throat> 30 centimeters is good, um, but if they are overheating, increase. But uh, if you want intense, intense um, effects, then you make it 30 but make sure the baby is not overheating. So 30 to 45 centimeters, okay? Works just well. So um, sometimes you find in cold seasons or weathers and mothers have washed their clothes and they're not drying and some may now bring their, their, their damp clothes and just place them over the photo box so they can, you know, benefit from the heat and warm the clothes. Nothing should be put on top of the phototherapy box okay don't do that so do not place anything on the phototherapy devices lights and baby both need to keep cool so do not block air vents or flow or the light also you need to keep the device clean free from dust and bacteria because remember these are little babies some of them are preterms and even if they're not preterms they're generally uh, you know, their neonates, the immunity is generally low. So if you don't keep and observe high levels of hygiene, you're likely to cause infections in the newborn unit. So you promote frequent breastfeeding. So every three hours, the baby should be removed from the photo box, at least for breastfeeding and for bonding with the mother. Unless they are dehydrated, supplements or intravenous fluids are unnecessary. Okay. So phototherapy can be interrupted for feeds and also to allow for bonding. From time to time, you need to change their position so that you can expose different areas of the skin to the light. So the, the more skin is exposed, the better. So you are recovering the eye and for boys especially, generally all children, all the babies, you will want to put them on pampas, okay? A well-fitting pamper. Okay, and for boys, this is particularly important because you do not want the testicles to overheat and interfere with the ability of this baby to have babies in future. So you must monitor um, um, vital signs. You must make sure they're not dehydrated. Okay, you must make sure they're feeding well. You need to monitor input and input uh, of the babies every six hours, and if they're developing pallor, that is just to check if they are hemolyzing. So remember to do uh, periodic or regular bilirubin tests 
as a part of monitoring and uh, I'll refer you to the uh, comprehensive newborn care protocols. So one of the things that you still can look at is the skin color, uh, but skin color cannot be relied on for evaluating the effectiveness of phototherapy. That is why we are saying you need to do serial uh, serum bilirubin according to the protocol. Then the skin of babies exposed to light may appear to be almost without jaundice in the presence of marked hyperbilirubinemia. So you see again, we're saying you cannot rely on the skin. Monitoring should continue for at least 24 hours uh, after uh, cessation of phototherapy in patients with hemolytic disease because of the risk of rebound uh, hyperbilirubinemia. Please ensure that each light source is working and emitting light. If you're using fluorescent lights, uh, they should be they should they should have been in use for they should have been in use for more than six months or usage time of more than two thousand hours. If this is the case, if they have been used for more than six months or um, so you look at six months or more than 2,000 hours. If the tubes have black ends, if they are flickering, or if according to the manufacturer specifications you are supposed to change them, then you need to change or replace them. Okay? That is about fluorescent lamps. There is another aspect of care that we call uh, family-centered care okay so family-centered care here is just including the mother or the caregiver in the treatment or management of the baby so it is important that the caregivers and mothers know what is going on what you want to do why you want to subject their baby to phototherapy and things like that so you need to explain to them the need for the treatment, okay? Why are you covering their eyes, okay? Why do you want the baby naked without clothes? How would you like the baby to be fed? How, what is the recommendation and how does she come in? And how is that going to work? You know, why do you have to keep on pricking the baby to get blood samples? And what are the potential complications that... Uh, are anticipated from this treatment. These things must be discussed with the caregiver or the mother. So standard phototherapy, this is short breastfeeding sessions of three hourly intervals. And then we have intensive phototherapy where you do not want to interrupt the exposure to the light. And so you may want to do NGT, uh, nasogastric tube feeding. So the mother expresses the milk and they give via a nasogastric tube so that you, you keep the baby in the photo box as much as possible. So that really depends on the severity of the jaundice. Some of the complications of phototherapy are the, some babies develop loose tools. There is, you know, when uh, I told you that uh, phototherapy works uh, on the skin, light and skin to convert the uh, unconjugated bilirubin to a, conjuga a conjugated form or water soluble form so there is something called lumirubin that is produced that lumirubin can lead to uh, gut irritation and cause loose stools and so if they develop loose stools remember uh, that can also predispose to dehydration so you need to be careful if they develop loose stools then you must take care of um, hydration status they, and that is the reason also they may get the rash baby can overheat and also get dehydrated because of the heat okay remember then they'll have increased insensible losses of water all right so again if you don't cover the eyes very well they may suffer uh, retinal damage uh, which is not good and if you subject a baby with uh, predominantly, you know, some babies will have a mixed hyperbilirubinemia. So we didn't talk about mixed hyperbilirubinemia here. We only talked about whether it is conjugated or unconjugated. But then you can have a mixed picture. And sometimes when it is mixed or predominantly 
conjugated hyperbilirubinemia and you subject them to phototherapy, then there, there's a tendency to develop what we call the bronze baby syndrome. That is a complication. Okay, so the bronze baby syndrome just refers to dark grayish brown discoloration of the skin, sometimes noted in infants undergoing phototherapy. Almost all infants observed with this syndrome have had a mixed type of hyperbilirubinemia with significant elevation of direct reacting bilirubin, like I said. So the discoloration may be due to photo-induced modifications uh, of por uh, porphyrins, which are often present during cholestatic and uh, jaundice and may last for several months, okay? So we don't use phototherapy. So besides uh, phototherapy, uh, the next other option that you need to consider when you want to reduce uh, unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia is exchange transfusion. So we have two modalities here, uh, phototherapy, and then we have exchange transfusion. And then of course the ultimate is the specific management where you are addressing the cause of the jaundice. So exchange transfusion simply involves removing some of the infant's blood and replacing it with the same amount of allogenic blood, of course, after doing grouping and cross-matching. Okay. So when do you consider exchange transfusion? It is when you have tried phototherapy and it has not given you desired effects. So you will be on phototherapy and the jaundice is not reducing or improving. And also in any infant who develops uh, carnicterus, any sign of carnicterus is an immediate indication for phototherapy. So uh -huh. the decision to perform exchange transfusion um, usually besides the fact that Phototherapy has not given you desired effect. Is any sign, like I said, that suggests carnicterus? Okay. So, for example, a healthy full intern, uh, term infant with physiological breast milk jaundice may tolerate a concentration slightly higher than 25 milligrams uh, per deciliter with no apparent ill effect, which means they will have no other signs accompanying the high rise in bilirubin levels. Whereas a baby may develop signs of bilirubin encephalopathy even when their bilirubin levels are way below 25. You see? So in this case, we are saying that you're looking at the bilirubin levels and then you're looking at what other signs is the baby developing. And you're looking at what is the effect that you're getting from um, phototherapy. And all these things help you to make the decision. I am sharing these things with you. They may be beyond the scope of this lesson, but they are good things for you to know because the day you'll be in a level two or level three hospital, you will need to make these decisions and save a baby's life. So in babies who have received, a, we have not gone into the details of how to perform it because it's beyond the scope of this lesson. But what are some of the complications that you need to let the mother know even as you're making the decision and maybe you, you're referring them and telling them the reason you're referring them is for um, exchange transfusion. So these are some of the complications that you expect. Number one, there could be acidosis. A baby can develop electrolyte uh, imbalances, they could develop hypoglycemia, they could develop thrombocytopenia, volume overload, arrhythmias, necroti uh, necrotizing, enterocolitis, infection, and uh, uh, reactions, blood transfusion reactions. All these are possibilities. And with that, uh, it's been a long, grueling lecture. You can listen to it in bits. Uh, jaundice is a very important uh, condition in our setting. Uh, while we say, in, and in most cases, the observation is that it's a benign condition, when the uh, unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia is not effectively treated, or when we have comorbidities, 
then the risk of neurotoxicity is high. And that makes jaundice very important. And there are uh, simple things that you can do to help a baby either not to develop jaundice or um, to manage when jaundice develops and to know when to make the right decisions, to know when to refer the baby. Okay, that is very important. So I want to thank you for your time and your attention. Um, like the page, give a thumbs up, share and let others know that they can pass by and just refresh themselves with this lecture. Thank you very much.